Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Davis. I am the Director of Business Development with eTrepid. Now, I'm here to help guide you on your journey uh, to compliance. I'm sure you have a lot of questions regarding HIPAA and compliance with COVID. Um, I'll provide my contact information at the end of the webinar in case you want to get a hold of me or the guest speaker regarding what you heard today. Now, I'd like to take a moment and introduce you all uh, to uh, Tom Blanford. Uh, Tom is the CEO of eTrepid. Tom has a unique career path that has resulted in the creation of a company in the image of his service as a US Navy veteran. Tom's military service and information technology background has led him to establish eTrepid, which has become a premier award-winning global IT services provider. Uh, we also have on the call today with us, Jim Garvin, eTrepid's Chief Information Security Officer. In addition, we have uh, John uh, Flores, uh, which is uh, eTrepid's uh, Business Development Manager, um, who will participate also in the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, once we get to that, uh, that point. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with eTrepid, our team focuses on areas of cybersecurity, cloud computing, AI, and machine learning, as well as unified communication services. Uh, eTrepid services are highly customizable and you know, can be specifically developed to meet any business needs or compliance concerns or requirements that you have. So uh, let us continue to provide you the support uh, you need as you travel through your compliance journey and explore CMMC, NIST, HIPAA, or any additional uh, regulations that is associated with your business. Now, today we're excited to have Paul Redding from Compliancy Group joining us for a little coffee and conversation. Paul has joined us prior to provide great insights into HIPAA standards. And so we're excited that he's joining us today again to help us to understand uh, COVID's effect on the compliance regulation. He will also explore uh, what you need to know in case uh, COVID vaccine mandates add to your compliance requirements as well as review uh, the approaches for managing controlled, unclassified uh, information uh, CUI. Now, after the presentation, uh, we'll address any questions you may have, and of course, do our best to provide you with the answers that you're looking for. Now, additionally, if you remain until the end of this event, uh, you'll have the opportunity to take advantage of a free HIPAA consultation uh, you can view the six steps to avoid HIPAA fines and download your very own HIPAA compliance checklist. Um, you know, will help you to determine what your next best steps are to remain uh, HIPAA compliant. All right, so we will hold questions and answers until after the presentation has concluded to give Paul the opportunity to provide all the information he has for us today. However, please feel free to use the Q&A feature provided at the bottom of the screen to ask questions as well as leave comments in the chat section. The eTrepid team is monitoring these sections and will provide answers to your questions uh, when we get to that portion of the conversation. Lastly, we have a number of people on today's virtual event and want to thank everyone for joining. If you were one of the first 100 people to register uh, and you remain until the end of this event, uh, you will receive a $10 Starbucks gift card on behalf of eTrepid. And of course, we want you to enjoy a cup of coffee on us. So after today's event, our team will follow up with you to ensure we have all the information needed to receive your card. So please keep in mind that we will be placing a call to you to confirm your mailing info. Uh, it, you know, we are providing you with a actual Starbucks gift card 
that we will need to mail out to you. So uh, please look out for our call. Uh, we'll follow up with you to make sure uh, that you, you do get that. We're really happy to uh, host our midday pick me up. So, you know, we want you to grab your coffee or grab your tea uh, and uh, settle in and, uh, you know, we'll get started. Folks, we are delighted to have Compliancy Group Vice President of Engagement and Cybersecurity, Paul Redding. Paul joined the Compliancy Group in 2019 after nearly 15 years as an owner of an IT services provider focused on supporting uh, medical and manufacturing clients, eventually building a client base that spanned over 25 states. Paul's team partnered closely with Compliancy Group to provide complete HIPAA compliance for their client. Uh, today, Paul works with other IT and cybersecurity service providers and their clients to navigate the complexities of the HIPAA laws so that they can confidently focus on their business. Thanks for joining us, Paul. The floor is all yours. All right, thanks so much, Ken. I appreciate you guys having me on today. Hello, everyone out there. My name is Paul Redding, as Ken said. I am Vice President of Cybersecurity and Partner Engagement, or as I jokingly say, I'm Vice President of Long Titles at Compliance Group. Uh, just a little brief background on me. I come out of the IT security space. I owned an IT security provider for about 14 years. So I've kind of seen the battle both from the cybersecurity side and from the compliance end. I was a compliancy group partner and uh, worked with them with all my medical clients in the past. If you are not familiar with compliancy group, I'm going to start out by just kind of telling you a little bit about us. So if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me just a second, get that set up. And so I don't distract myself, I'm going to turn off my video for this portion of the call. All right, <clears throat> like I said, with Compliancy Group today, we're going to be talking about the effect really that the pandemic, COVID has had on the world of compliance, specifically around HIPAA, uh, what the work from anywhere world means in terms of maintaining compliance and security in your practice. I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that we as an industry leader in healthcare have gotten on what seems like an almost daily basis since this thing started. So first of all, uh, I want to, again, thank our host, Etrepid. They're a great partner of ours at Compliancy Group. Matter of fact, if you go to their website, you take a look at their HIPAA compliance page, you're going to find that seal of compliance right there on that site. That seal is what we issue when you go through our process at Compliancy Group to achieve, illustrate, and maintain your HIPAA compliance. And organizations like Etrepid really use this, first and foremost, to protect you as their customer. Uh, you know, there's a lot of faith that we in the community put in our IT provider and in our cybersecurity provider. You really are handing over the keys to the kingdom when you say, come on in here, take over support, you know, manage my 365 or Google environment, protect all these systems. So one of the first things that, that eTrepid does that's very different than a lot of the providers in the space is they look internally first. They're not going to work, for example, in the healthcare space unless they know that they themselves are compliant and then they're not misleading or lying to their customers when they say, I can take care of this for you. Now, secondarily, the reason that they chose us as a partner to help them do this is, I'm going to be honest with you, HIPAA compliance is, is a very complex thing. In fact, compliance and the HIPAA law itself is 700 pages long of legalese that's written by lawyers to be audited and interpreted by other lawyers. I don't care if you're an IT cybersecurity firm like eTrepid or you know, an ambulatory surgical center, you didn't get into this business to have to weed through all this crazy legalese and try to run your business at the same time. Etrepid chooses us because what we do is we make compliance simple and easy. And in that process, what they've, they've really done is they've built an internal culture that reflects the industry they serve. Etrepid is first and foremost, believe it or not, a healthcare company because so many of you out there are in healthcare. They're in manufacturing or they're in the supply chain. 
because so many of you out there are in the supply chain. They have to take on the same standards and controls that you do and build that into their culture on a daily basis. And that's why that seal goes on their site because it ultimately shows, hey, we take this seriously. It's an actionable thing. You guys can get off this call now, go there, click on it, and we're going to tell you all the steps and all the things that we've taken them through to make them a qualified provider and a provider of choice in your industry. So I just want to give a special thanks to them, both obviously for inviting us, but also for taking that extra step and being willing to protect such a vital and critical part of our American economy. Now, that portion of the economy, healthcare, that's where we were born. Compliancy Group, if you've not run into us before, if you haven't seen that seal on some of your association, Compliancy Group was built 17 years ago by HIPAA auditors. If you go back to 2005, you've got a team of HIPAA auditors that are going out and being paid really large sums of money by groups like you know, Kaiser and LA County, Tennessee Department of Health, these large enterprise healthcare organizations. And what we were being paid to do was to go in, do a complete audit, look at the entire organization, yes, the IT, but as much as anything else, the administrative functions, the organizational requirements, we would do a full audit around it, tell you absolutely everything that was wrong and what you had to do to fix it. But the problem that we ran, in, ran into was that we would come back a year later and do it again and all the same problems still existed. No matter how big or sophisticated the organization was, without a clear roadmap as to how to implement these changes, without clear guidelines on a, as to the work that needs to be performed, nothing got done. These organizations were just spinning their wheels in a series of audits. So compliancy group took a tool that we actually used internally to perform these audits. It was a software called the Guard, and we turned it into what it is today. We built it out to be what I call QuickBooks, but for compliance. It's a software as a service solution, sits in the cloud. It is a place where all of your audits and all of your policies and all of your procedures, employee training, business associate management, contract management, incident response and whistleblowing, all the things that are in that 700 page law live inside our software, just like all the financial requirements live inside QuickBooks, right? If, if you put the data into QuickBooks correctly and you get audited, then you're gonna be able to prove that what you did was right and you won't get any fines. But just like QuickBooks, we realized you don't know what to put in there. As an organization in healthcare, you don't know what to do to actually populate that data so today, we have a methodology built out that's somewhat unique. We sit in the space between, here's a software, you do this, hope you don't screw it up, and here's this crazy expensive consultant that's going to fly in and look at all your stuff in person. What we do is we pair our QuickBooks style software with, think, a, 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 an accountant. We call them compliance coaches. This is somebody that will run you through all the exercises required, all the audits, the building out of the policies and procedures, maintain and, and really run your employee, employee training program, and ultimately provide the guidance that's required to get you over that hump. Today, we're very proud to say we're the endorsed solution by over 40 major medical associations for that reason. Our version of simplified compliance has got the sole endorsement for the American Dental Association, the American Chiropractic, the American Optometric, and dozens and dozens of others of these uh, associations. And if you look around in, in, for example, MySpace, you'll find that most of the IT service providers and a tremendous number of the vendors in our space also use us to maintain their own compliance. So, guys, I'm going to try my best not to spend all my time today in the dark, murky world of cyber attacks and fines and penalties. Fear, urgency, and doubt is being spread like wildfire throughout all the communities, but there is a reason behind that. I have to include some of it because it's the reality of the world we're in. Folks, we are at war with malicious actors called hackers. These work for nation states. They work for themselves on the private side. Believe it or not, you can go in a place called the dark web right now and apply for a job as a $250,000 employee for a cyber criminal organization that provides things like health insurance and a 401k. They set you up with a fake but very real looking occupation to do the things that you see on this slide here in front of us. 
in 2021, right in the middle of the pandemic with everything else we had going on in healthcare, we saw five times more ransomware attacks than ever before in history. And we are on pace to get past that by June of this year. Matter of fact, Health and Human Services will tell you that over nine out of 10 healthcare organizations have experienced some form of data breach over the last three years. Now, when I say that stat, it's really frightening, right? Like 93% of businesses have been breached. Here's the question. How many of them do you think actually know they got breached? I don't believe for a second that nine out of 10 healthcare organizations actually realizes that they've lost this data and that some of these things have happened. I'm not going to read all these stats, but I'm going to jump all the way to the bottom and tell you five years ago, if a group like eTrepid invited me on and I was going to talk about the risks associated with, you know, the loss of data for healthcare, I would talk about ransomware and the fact that you would have to pay these exorbitant rates to get your stuff back from these criminals. The reality is ransomware is still a very, very real and growing problem, but it's not the worst thing we face out there. As a matter of fact, let's take the idea of killware. Specific attacks designed to do what? Destabilize American infrastructure by sadly killing people. In the middle of that same pandemic, we had a hospital on the West Coast deliberately shut down by nation state actors. They ransomware the, the, everything on their servers, they shut the entire system down, and it wasn't for the money. See what had to happen right then? They had to send all their critical care patients elsewhere. You're talking about ambulancing, flying, everybody out there trying to move them to a place where they can actually get health care, and people died. And something outside of healthcare, I'm sure everybody's aware, a hacker actually tried to use the water system in Florida to poison thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. This stuff is getting very, very real, and that's why the enforcement around compliance is increasing. Because if we don't do something about this, we collectively are going to lose. Now, as I promised in the beginning, I want to answer questions that get asked a lot about what's going on during this whole pandemic. And one of the first ones that I get asked flies absolutely in the face of what I just said there. See, in the very beginning of this thing, the, the, the president came out on the news and says, hey, you know, we are going to lighten HIPAA requirements in certain cases and suspend them in others in order to make things easier to deal with, right? It's an emergency standard that's been enacted. So as we oftentimes do, people heard what they wanted to hear. What you just heard is I said HIPAA has been suspended. So our phones at Compliancy Group blew up with all our customers saying, wait a second, do I have to deal with this stuff at all? Is this gone now? <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Another one that's been a big question is, okay, I'm a non-medical business. I'm an accountant that has some healthcare requirements. Great, I understand that I'm a business associate. But what if I'm just like, you know, I don't know, the, the print shop down the street. I've got 100 plus employees. And right now I know OSHA, this thing has been blocked by the federal government temporarily or by the, the Supreme Court has blocked it. But we're gonna see this thing shake out. If vaccine status is required by me as an employer, does that make me a healthcare organization? What's the implication of this stuff, right? Then you all other questions a lot more simple, like how do I talk to my patients safely? I, somebody told me that business associate agreements are suspended, right? And then here's the big one. I sent everybody home. Do I have to do all this crazy cybersecurity stuff at their house? Like what am I supposed to do now that I have a work from anywhere world? We're going to hit that stuff today and we're going to go right into it right now. But just as a quick pause, first, I'm going to teach you a 700 page law. No, just kidding. Just kidding. That would be miserable for everybody involved, especially me. What I am going to do, though, is I'm going to clarify something about HIPAA, because it's really, it's a good way to illustrate compliance as a concept, is to take this thing and break it down into its most simple format, which is all these compliance standards are a series of rules, okay? In HIPAA, we have three. We have the privacy rule, the security rule, and the omnibus rule. And all 700 plus pages fit nice and neat into these three sections. Now, the privacy rule, I think by and at large, medical providers understand, and even to some extent, the general public, think of it as like the paperwork that you have to fill out when you go to a doctor and tell them that yes, they can or can't share your medical information with your family. You know, the things that, that are specific to medical treatment, like, I don't know if you ever noticed that the doctor has to turn around the clipboard on the wall or close the screen to their laptop when they leave it in the room with you, right? Privacy stuff. 
the security rule, when I say that, everybody nods their head and goes, yep, 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 eTrepid's job. That's where all the cybersecurity stuff is. The security rule, cybersecurity, move along. <laughs> Pause for just a second. See, for every rule, you have a couple of audits. So for the privacy rule, you have privacy audits. They have nothing to do with IT. They're about the facing the direction of your clipboards, whether or not they can see your screen. Stuff that you do inside your organization from an administrative privacy perspective. The security rule, yes, IT is there, but actually IT only makes up one third of the security rule. There are two audits that are that make up the IT portion of them. One of them is what I call the asset audit. That means all your computers, all your cloud systems, all your thumb drives, wherever you put your EAPHI and data, what is the device, what's on it, how do you protect it? Simple enough, right? The other one you've probably been familiar with if you're a medical provider through like MIPS and meaningful use is the IT risk assessment. That's eTrepid's job. Those two right there. They tell you what the systems are, how you're protecting them, and then they answer about 100 questions about the actual IT infrastructure that you have going on in your business and how it is or is not effective in protecting all that EPHI. Simple enough, right? But it's not the whole security rule. The physical audit, for example, is about your physical office. Do you have an alarm system? Do you have fire extinguishers? Questions that most people would never think to ask when you talk about HIPAA. And then there's an administrative and privacy audit that's the physical workforce security that you have in place around your employees, okay? That's the security rule. So again, IT is only one third of it. And I know this is complicated, but remember, we didn't touch my friend Omnibus over there at all. It's a weird word, omnibus. I'm going to give everybody out there a way to remember it. Think of HIPAA as this. And this is, I'm done with your lesson, okay? You got the privacy rule, the security rule that includes IT, and then this weird one. Let's call it the on the bus rule. Easier to remember. If you're on this healthcare bus, then all your vendors have to get their butts on the bus with you. If I have a single client in healthcare and I can conceivably interact with their EPHI, I'm in eTrepid, I'm working with a dentist and I uh, support their systems, then I'm a healthcare provider too. And that's where the concept of both breach notification standards and those pesky business associate agreements that either you have to sign or you have to send out. That's where all that stuff comes from. And yes, there are audits around it as well. So again, the only reason I show you this stuff in detail is understand a compliance standard means a series of audits followed by policies, procedures, and training around the results of that stuff. It's not an IT problem. Now, that omnibus rule that I hit there at the end, I just want to clarify again, when we talk about who needs to be HIPAA specifically compliant today, I am not only talking to you if you're a dentist or a doctor or a chiropractor, okay? Healthcare providers of all types you are what's called a covered entity, and obviously you're under the HIPAA standard. But again, any other organization that supports all of those businesses I just named, from managed service providers like eTrepid, all the way out to the email hosting providers, or let's say you rent a physical storage facility for paper EPHI, for paper PHI, guess what? All those folks, they're business associates of yours. Those vendors also have the requirement to be under these laws. And with the exception of one of those six audits, a business associate, just like a covered entity, has to do absolutely everything the same. So this does go much farther than just the medical community. Now, let's start with those questions real quick. Has HIPAA been suspended? Simply put, absolutely no, not never. Absolutely not. This is not going to happen during this emergency. It didn't happen during Hurricane Katrina or any of the other horrible disasters that have plagued our country in the last couple of decades, okay? HIPAA is a law that once passed will never stop, and enforcement has not even slowed down, not an inch. If you take a look at it, all these, this what you see right here, this is called, and you guys can Google it, it's called the HIPAA Wall of Shame. Google that, and what you're going to find is a government-maintained list of good people that bad things happen to. If you have a breach, if you are found lacking under HIPAA, if you are fined or you have an incident, you are going to go on this website. You're searchable by where you are, who you are, what type of provider, what type of incident, what type of information was stolen, what you had to pay in fines, and what you had to do. 
you don't want to end up on this list. And this list has grown exponentially during a period of time when people are asking us, has HIPAA been suspended? So I'll reiterate again, no, not only has it not been suspended, but the fines are being issued at a record pace. Matter of fact, the trend of 2021 was patient right to access. 12 out of 14 fines were related just to me as a patient asking for a medical record that you can't provide or that it took you too long to provide or that you thought you had a reason to charge me too much for this, okay? These groups right here, these are not multi-million dollar practices. I don't know Dr. Robert Glazer, but I am willing to bet you that this is not a, you know, 300 per bed hospital, right? $100,000 worth of fines are levied because when I ask you for a medical record, you've got 30 days to give it to me in the format I need it. At day 31, they can hit you with a fine. And folks, I'm going to look into my crystal ball real quick and tell you by the end of 2022, the number is going to shrink to 15 days. By the end of this year, if I ask you for my medical records, you have 15 days to get it to me. That's why when you talk to your e-trepid rep and they're talking about, hey, you really need real-time backups. I, I was at an event recently where somebody said, I back up my data once a month. Is that adequate for HIPAA? I mean, I have a question back. How many medical records are you allowed to lose during that one month time? You have it back, you back it up today. You're not going to back it up again for another month. Halfway through it, how many medical records are you allowed to lose before the fines start? Trick question. The answer is absolutely zero, none, period. You are expected to put forth a good faith effort to protect and back up all of your data all of the time. That's why these fines are hitting so hard and so fast, because people, A, don't understand, and B, can't believe they're serious. Tr folks, I'm telling you, by the end of this year, it will be 15 days, and it's not 15 days, but I need 45 because my building burned down, okay? Now, this was one day in September, 2020, right in the middle, again, I have to say, middle of a pandemic, you have people hit with five of these fines all at once, and these are not the result of an audit. These people didn't get audited. A patient complained it took too long or cost too much, and Health and Human Services hit them with this. So, no. Question number one and answer number one, we're not suspending HIPAA. Second one is really confusing to people. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. I think the answer is pretty straightforward, but you, I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth. Look, this is from Health and Human Services. You asking your employees if they are vaccinated or if they have had COVID, for example, is not a violation of HIPAA. It does not put you under the private privacy rule. As a matter of fact, they've been very clear, and I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but this is the wording from Health and Human Services. It says it only applies to covered entities and business associates. That means if you weren't a covered entity before and you weren't a business associate before, just because you asked me as your employee about my vaccination status doesn't make you one now. Okay, that's the easiest way to explain this to you. The reality is this is a place where because of the emergency that we're under, they took a look at this, they did their own internal investigation and their own interpretation, and they have come out and said, no, absolutely not. We are not forcing the entire country, essentially, and say everyone over 100 employees to become a healthcare organization. So that's a little bit of good news. If you're on this call because you think, oh my God, you know, I asked my employees about HIPAA, when I ask that they're vaccinated, trust me, you're fine. You did not. That doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to find some other info here that makes you think you should be, you know, doing the right things around compliance. But no, if you're asking about it as your employer or their school, if you are asking your friend, hey, did you get the vaccine? Or if you ask your doctor, for example, you have a right to ask your doctor if they're vaccinated and they can't tell you that no, they're protecting their own EPHI by not answering the question. But stuff did change. HIPAA wasn't suspended. And you didn't make the entire country a medical provider because they asked about COVID, you know, COVID vaccine status. But those questions are not coming from a vacuum. People are asking those questions because they heard both the president, Secretary of Health and Human Services, other public officials say things like HIPAA has changed because of the COVID uh, pandemic or we're suspending these requirements around HIPAA because of the emergency status, right? So let me clear this stuff up real fast. First of all, the first two things that were changed 
probably don't apply to you at all. And if they do, you are in a med you are a medical provider in a very specific circumstance. So the first one, look, they basically what they did is they said now patients can get a doctor and use a doctor almost anywhere, and they're opening up the ability of Medicare to cover telehealth visits. It's really a two part deal. They said you're not going to be able to find a medical practitioner close by in the current environment that is set up for, ET, for telehealth. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna make it where Medicare will pay for people anywhere to treat you. And we're gonna move a bunch of red tape to make it easier for you to get treatment when you can't leave the house. Makes perfect sense. It's something that really needed to happen in the, in the first place. And honestly, all it did is that these two things, these first two, all they did is they springboarded telehealth five years overnight. We went from you know a five to fifteen percent adoption of telehealth across most small clinics to an eighty-five or ninety percent adoption of at least some form of telehealth services. Right? It's wonderful. It's great. But let's get to the third one. It created a real constraint in the economy and in, in the medical sector because if every provider in the world jumped out there immediately, there simply wasn't enough room, space, or time to jump on and know that the telehealth platform you were using was HIPAA compliant. As a matter of fact, there is a relatively and still is a relatively limited number of platforms that can be safely used and will sign your business associate agreement. So what happened? The government did suspend business associate agreements around this one little thing. They said, okay, if you're a telehealth or a doctor needing to provide service through telehealth, we're not going to make you get a business associate agreement right now with those telehealth providers until further notice during this emergency and kind of highlight those two phrases, we are going to suspend the requirement that you do good faith and get your business associate agreement in place with these telehealth uh, companies. What that means is for all practical purposes, you can use just about any non-publicly facing system right now to do a medical treatment. Now, let's talk about that for a second though. So there's discretionary enforcement of these BAAs. They're saying that, look, covered entities have always been allowed to share data with the public or with public health organizations without a business associate. So we're going to make that easier. Business associates can now share COVID data. And as we saw earlier, a private organization sharing information about your status is no longer, it's not going to be covered under the privacy rule. And then we're saying, hey, you know, if you don't have the right tool in place, we want to make it easier for you to treat people. So for right now, we're going to let you use VoIP, you know, your voice over IP systems, or any of these telehealth platforms without the requirement for a BAA. But I'm going to tell you something for a second. Can and should are two wildly different things. This last one right here, that's not the best idea anybody ever had. The reality is those business associate agreements, while they're suspended and they said, great, you get to use, I'll take one, for example, all of the sudden you could use FaceTime if you want to, to treat me in a medical fashion. But why were those business associate agreement requirements there in the first place? You see, while it makes it easier to adapt telehealth and makes more people willing to jump out there and do it as the providers, those business associate agreements are the only way you know if the platform is safe. So while the federal government is telling you right now, you can choose any of these three on this page and go right to work and, you know, treat me as, as a medical patient, I'm going to tell you a really important difference. See, Zoom has a cheap version and a more expensive version, and they'll sign a business associate agreement on the bigger version. Microsoft Teams. Microsoft is going to sign your business associate agreement right now. But this over here on the right, Apple and FaceTime, that's not happening. They're not signing it now. They don't have a HIPAA compliant version you can pay more for. They're not willing to say what the business agreement says. And a business associate agreement says, I accept responsibility for the medical records you're giving me. I, in my organization, am compliant and ready to take this, and I have the right protections in place, both from a privacy perspective and from an IT perspective. So you see, if I'm a psychiatrist and I'm going to treat somebody about their feelings of self-harm, which is something that happened on the West Coast during this pandemic, you have a psychiatrist that used a, I'm not going to call out the specific platform, but say a platform that would not sign a business associate agreement, hence was not usable before this rule change. 
He uses this platform to treat a patient. Patient tells him all kinds of things about self-harm and trouble at work and all this stuff. That ended up on YouTube. People could watch and see this. Now, psychiatrists didn't get a fine from the federal government because right now during the pandemic, he's allowed to do that. But that patient's life is ruined. That patient can sue him, absolutely. And more importantly, the damage is done reputationally to both of them. You see, without that business associate agreement in place, you don't know the difference from eTrepid and Bob's broken computer shop down the street. But when eTrepid willingly enters into an agreement and says, yes, I take responsibility for my side of it. Yes, I'm aware of the requirements that, are, that, are un, that I'm under in order to say I will do this. And yes, you can ask me questions and I will answer them about my compliance. When they do that, they're telling you you should work with them. And when Bob's broken computer shop says, no, man, I'm not a business associate, but I can fix your broken computer, you know they don't have in place what they should to be working with you. Now, what is it? And I know everybody on this call is not an IT provider or an IT nerd, so I'm not going to dive into crazy complex controls. If I sign a business associate agreement with you, it says I have the basic HIPAA safeguards in place. And back to HIPAA never being suspended or canceled, these are never going to change. Access control means who can get to it and how. Endpoint protection, you probably have heard people call it antivirus. We have evolved past that. If you say, I want antivirus, your folks at eTrepid are going to, you know, the hair on the back of their neck stands up. We're way beyond that. But think how you protect the actual computers, right? Monitoring and auditing. This is a huge difference in going and buying an antivirus product off the shelf at Best Buy and having an organization like eTrepid put in a solution that protects you according to HIPAA compliance. I've got to be able to see what's happening in real time and go back through what are logs and audit what's happened in the past. I can't do forensics if you're not collecting data. Monitoring and auditing is huge, as is network security. This is, think of it as who gets in and out of this organization. You, why did you have that firewall at your office? Because you needed network security. But wait a minute, nobody works at the office anymore. Half your people went home. How does that plug into that world? That's the network security piece. And then the last thing, backup and disaster recovery. This is a place where I pause because everybody knows that you got to back up your computers or your server. But I had somebody recently say, well, I mean, look, all my medical data is in, is in Office 365. I use SharePoint. So I'm good, right? It's in the cloud. It's backed up. Folks, the cloud is not backed up. Microsoft, Google, all of your cloud providers are going to tell you we're not backing your data up. We're making it highly available in 30-day increments, but ransomware, for example, is absolutely capable of taking out your cloud repositories and shutting that stuff down. So if I sign your business associate agreement, it means I'm doing all of these things all of the time and I can prove it. That's why you're supposed to use my platform. So can and should, you can use whatever you want. You should use someone that's doing the right thing. But I told you in the beginning, IT is not all of this law. It also means when I sign that business associate agreement, we do our own risk assessments. At least annually, I am going into my system, into my environment, auditing myself and making sure there's not easy ways for people to hurt me. And if they're there, I fix them. It means I have policies and procedures in place, not just IT meaningful or you know, acceptable use policies, but functional policies and procedures that tell my employees and everyone in my organization how they're supposed to do their job and protect your data. And then lastly, I am training my employees, both on cybersecurity and on HIPAA, on privacy and security simultaneously, so that I am truly protecting your data. All of that stuff doesn't change when you send these people home. If you sent them home and they're working on a computer that you no longer own, they're working on one from their house, or they're using their cell phone to access your EHR, did you give them a bring your own device policy? For that matter, do your policies allow for them to work from the house? Do you know if their home has any form of infrastructural security at all? I'm not saying that you've got to show up at everybody's house and somebody from eTrepid has to wear the, you know, booty covers, 
the, like the air conditioner repairman does and dig through the trash. I'm saying we have an audit that we're going to give your employees that ask really basic questions around what's going on in that environment. Because just because it's not your office does not mean that these people are absolved of all security requirements under HIPAA. For example, the EPHI going into that environment and coming out, is it encrypted and how? both on the traffic side, this is where you'll hear that famous, you know, VPN, you hear the providers talk about VPN, or now it's, you know, SASE, CASB, there's a, b- a bunch of software versions thereof, that's the tr- in-transit encryption. But if they're opening it on the computer locally, is that computer encrypted? Is their phone protected? You don't get to just walk away from this because everyone went home, HIPAA compliance followed you to their house. And remember how I told you, a lot of that was IT, the rest of it's the soft side. Think about it. It's someone's responsibility to tell your employees what they can and can't do at their house. For example, I've seen a little meme of, you know, the husband and wife sitting on the couch, laptop side by side working, and it says the new office. Not if you're in healthcare or military manufacturing, it's not. I can't let my spouse see my screen. My eight-year-old can read. If I'm a doctor working on medical records, I've got to have something in place and be trained to close my screen, to log out, or to at least lock my screen when I get up. Because even if it's my eight-year-old, he's still not allowed to see your medical records sitting on my screen. And all those privacy controls are in place at the office, but fell apart when you went home. And the reason that's so critical, the reason that you will hear me and all these experts talk about the soft side of compliance so much is the reality is that's the biggest problem for you. It's kind of like the vampire in the movies. Look, each Trepid's tools and all the technology in the world, think about it like saying, I could put crosses on the windows and garlic on the doors, but if I invite the vampire in for dinner, I am going to be dessert. Your human beings, the people sitting in your office, create the biggest risk for breach for you. And without policies, procedures, and training, you cannot protect yourself from your employees. This gentleman right here is famous for making a tremendous mistake. He was running the Hawaii Emergency Management Association software. And he was very proud of the new job that he got. So proud that he put this up as his Facebook profile with his password on his screen in the background. Now, if you live in Hawaii, you know exactly where I'm going with this, because one day your phone went off with the like Amber Alert sounding noises uh, 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 and said, this is not a test. North Korea has launched thermonuclear attack against Hawaii, basically crawl under a desk and text your loved ones goodbye. People are freaking out and it wasn't a hack. It was what we call in my industry, like a script kitty in his mom's basement, basically, got this guy's password off the internet where he made it publicly available. No technology that I can put in place is going to prevent this from happening. But I'm here to tell you, it's not this gentleman's fault. His organization simply had to implement the soft side of compliance. Assessments. I would walk past the desk during a risk assessment, see that stuck on your screen and rip it off. Then I would direct you to the policy you are in violation of and the procedure for credentials management you're not following. And lastly, we would retrain you. We would mandate that you go back through something that teaches you the proper way to do your job. If these three things were in place, technology aside, that doesn't happen. That's why the law is fining everyone because of things like policies and procedures. Folks, it is a scary world out there. You don't have to make it easier for the bad guys, okay? One thing that really stands out to me in these stats is the third one here. Almost 30% of respondents said that their companies were forced to remove jobs following a ransomware attack. If I'm using this stuff to destabilize this country and hurt our infrastructure, I am winning. I am being successful. Why? It's not because the technology is failing. I'll tell you right now, these organizations do not have in place the right policies, procedures, and training to protect themselves. Now, we've talked a lot about healthcare. We've talked a lot about HIPAA and compliance. I want to kind of wrap this thing up and and tell you, because I get a question a lot that says, what if I'm not in healthcare? What if I'm not sure I'm in healthcare? What if I just have a tiny footprint there? Do I not have to worry about this whole compliance thing? I told you we're losing a war, right? Well, you're probably familiar with the New York Shield Act. You heard it, saw it on the news. 
Massachusetts Privacy Act went largely unreported, and is Maryland. If you're in my industry, you know about Louisiana because they're targeting us. But did you know Texas has a wall of shame and Colorado and HIPAA? And wait for it, folks, over half the states of the United States are actively voting on cybersecurity and compliance laws right now today. Over half of them are looking and enacting in the next 12 months something that is going to bring this to the private sector, okay? Now, imagine a world where we have 50 states and 50 privacy standards and 50 security standards, and you have to, if you're working across state lines, you have to achieve all of those. <laughs> I, I don't know how it can work. I do not believe that it is possible for us to have 50 standards all uncontrolled at a state level and continue to do business. It's a literal dumpster fire waiting to happen, and it's not going to make us any more secure. These states and everyone in my industry are calling out for a national standard, something to unify behind, picture like GDPR in Europe, something that says, look, we have a clear set of federal guidelines. In your industry, we are selecting these organizations and these groups and these associations, and they're going to help us implement compliance and security into it. And ultimately, here's the centralized framework. I'm a nerd. I know I'm in IT. I can't help it. I call it one ring to rule them all, right? The one ring to rule them all that says we will incorporate all of the best standards from all of these guidelines and give you a place that you can do what? Apply it to your business and protect yourself. Now, it might already exist. I'm not saying that this thing, if you're in manufacturing, you see CMMC here, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, you know exactly what this is. If you're in the rest of the private sector, this might be news to you. But in the Department of Defense supply chain, something that smells a lot like what I just described exists. Instead of applying a law to the smallest guy and the biggest guy equally, CMMC actually tears you. So if you're a very small, low-risk client, you got 17 things you need to do. If you're working with sensitive data, picture, if, it was an, if this was a national standard, think healthcare, you've got about 110. And then if you're at a certain level, you're going to have to go through mandatory audits on a triannual basis where they are going to look at this and tell you whether or not you passed or failed. Now, the implementation of something like this all the way across the board will be time consuming and it will be intense, but I'm here to tell you folks, we cannot succeed. We cannot win this war until we unify behind something, whether it's this or something similar, something that allows us all to say, yes, I understand. I get it. I'm actually supposed to do something about this. So HIPAA, back to my friend HIPAA, I'll tell you what they're doing. And this is going to start to be the standard with a lot of different compliance standards and laws. They passed a rule, and, and it, the irony of the time frame is literally on January 5th, right before the most contentious election in history, or the inauguration of history, January 5th, this bill, H.R. 7898, went across Congress, or House of Representatives, Senate, and the President's desk completely unopposed. Everybody signed it. It was actually bipartisan. And what it says is, take that standard CMMC. It's written by a group called NIST. Or there's a Cybersecurity Act of 2015. It gives clear guidelines. There's another one, CIS. What it says is it says there are these recognized security standards. If you will implement them into your organization today, we're going to protect you. We're going to fine you less or not at all. We're going to audit you for a shorter period of time or not at all. Ultimately, what it says is, if you would just do what we're talking about and implement something that's a recognized security standard, if you get breached, we'll treat you like the victim of a crime, not the perpetrator. This is the trend, folks. This is where we're headed. So what you need to do is reach out to each rep and, and sit down with them and determine, what is my compliance standard that I must achieve? What's the most effective security program and, and uh, framework for me to implement and get that stuff in place? You can protect yourself today from 50 different state standards or one national one by simply implementing the guidelines that you've been given for the last decade. There's nothing new about this. It all starts with simply conducting a risk analysis, looking at your organization, decide what you have, what the bad guys are going to want, what is in place, what you can do to improve it, what the likelihood is that it's going to happen to you, and ultimately, 
what's the impact? If you do that, then you can build a plan with each rep that says, you know, I'm in medical. We're going to bring those compliance guys in. We're going to get all that stuff done because I know I don't have my policies and procedures right. But you know what else? We have to look at where I'm storing my data. We have to look at that thing he was talking about, about backing up my cloud. Those things become self-evident when you do a risk analysis first. That's what we have done. It's what we continue to do with eTrepid. We work with you and we work with groups like theirs to help you achieve compliance through audits, illustrate compliance through your policies, procedures, administrative functions and training, and maintain it over time. If you work with us, if you work with them and implement these things and the auditor comes knocking, instead of saying, oh God, I've got 30 days to produce all this information or they're going to find me millions of dollars, you're going to say, hey, folks at Compliance Group, folks at eTrepid, it's time for me to do what you said and illustrate my compliance. And we're going to generate out a series of reports. The last thing I'll tell you is that seal of compliance that eTrepid's onboarded, that seal of compliance that we issue when you go through this achieve, illustrate, maintain compliance. No partner has ever failed an audit that carries that seal of compliance and we're engaged in two or three at any given moment. We won't give it to you unless we can prove that you've done your good faith effort and that you can pass an audit. Now, Ken, I'm going to wrap that thing up. I, I think that's what I've got today. I'm excited to see if we have any questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to hand it back over to you. Paul, thank you for being flexible with the information you provided today and uh, ensuring everyone is informed about IPA compliance. Now, folks, as anticipated, we do have some questions in the queue. So let's invite uh, eTrepid CEO, Tom Blanford, and Chief Information Security Officer, Jim Garvin on uh, to provide answers, as well as eTrepid team member, John Flores. Remember folks, if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature provided at the bottom of the screen to share. And of course, we will try our best to answer your questions uh, as, as the best we can. Uh, John, what is the first question? Okay, thank you, Ken. The first question is, what is the expected timeline associated with incorporating HIPAA compliance into your organization and expected associated cost? You know, um, th this is a conversation we were having the, the other day. It depends on your organization, to be honest with you. We can put you through our process, you know, moving you from zero to a place where you have all of your policies, all of your procedures, all that stuff in a period of weeks, or at most maybe a month or two in a very few hours. But the remediation inside your organization from a technical perspective, I think Jim and, and, and your team, you, you guys could probably put some color around that. It really depends on where you are today and your risk profile based on what you do. Paul, you're absolutely right. So you have to do an assessment. Every, every organization is going to be different. So just to be able to put a number on it uh, is, uh, we, we wouldn't want to do that. Uh, it's an assessment uh, first to really determine how much mitigation uh, is required. And then we could, then we could do a time frame. All right. Uh, the second question uh, is, what are the odds of being audited? And what sh should I expect if I am? Uh, you know, I'll go ahead and hit this one first and when I see what you guys think. Um, the, the audits come from a lot of different places. There are random audits, although the odds of that are pretty low. You're not going to find yourself very likely under a random audit. Most likely what happens is you either have an incident or somebody files a report on you. For example, any patient, any employee, anybody in your environment that thinks they see something wrong or sadly can be malicious and report you can turn it in and create an investigation. If I report a HIPAA violation, it legally must be investigated. Now, an investigation also comes in a lot of different formats. When I do my information requests and I ask you for all this data as the Office of Civil Rights, OCR, your response can immediately lead into an audit simply by not having the data, the documentation, or the proof, right? It's about how you respond to me about an incident that leads to a true audit. The third question is, you mentioned that records need to be provided in 30 days in a format needed. Is there an example of what that format should look like? Well, you know, it's really the format that the patient requested, honestly. You've got to give it to me in a usable format for me. So I need to be able to read my medical records about the treatment that you've provided me, the diagnosis that you've given, all of that stuff. 
this is actually a place where it, it's kind of interesting. You know, we talk all the time about encrypting email when you send out EPHI. It's absolutely critical that you encrypt that stuff. Unless I, as your patient, say, hey, doc, I need you to send this email to paul at AOL.com, right? I have a, an email from the 90s that's not going to be encrypted at the source. You can tell me it's a bad idea. In most cases, most organizations would send me something saying, hey, we don't recommend we do it this way. But at the end of the day, you got to provide me my medical records. And it's your responsibility as the provider to get it to me within that patient right to access window. Okay, great. Uh, the fourth question, uh, asking about the vaccination status is one thing, but if I need to keep records of this status, would that be considered protected under the privacy rule? No, no, they really excluded all of this vaccination and COVID status stuff for, for employers. It's outside the scope of HIPAA. You're allowed to do this as a, kind of like a private citizen asking a private citizen. And there's some other stuff that's happening with the way that they're enacting rules and regulations to kind of alleviate this thing. They have made it easier. For example, one of the changes in HIPAA was to make it easier for a business associate, not a covered entity, but you know, a third party vendor to actually share the results of tele HIPAA testing, et cetera. All right, thank you. Next question is, where can I go to gain more information about cybersecurity laws being voted on in my state? I think you guys had a couple on that list, right? We were talking about this earlier today, where, where we find the information on, on this stuff. Uh, one, I would say, is the NCSL. It is the, uh, somebody help me here, it's the National Committee of State Legislatures, I think but it's ncsl.org. It's a great place to be able to see all the regulations and all the rules are being passed in different states all under kind of one pane of glass. You guys, have, uh, is there anywhere else? There was somewhere you mentioned when we were talking about this that was, uh, that was uh, interesting to me, where you guys find information. Oh, uh, it was, so I, I look at the NCSL as, as well, oh, okay. National Conference of State Legislatures is, is where we go. Okay, okay. gotcha. All right, uh, that's it for the question and answer portion. Uh, thank you so much for everyone's participation. And thank you, Paul, for you know the information that you provided today. Absolutely. Everybody, thank you so much for having me on again. Really appreciate it. Everyone out there in the you know virtual world, hope you're safe and well. And uh, we will see you all very soon, hopefully in person. All right, folks, uh, lots of great questions. Thank you all. Paul, once again, thank you for adding to our coffee and conversation by, you know, taking the time to share such important information with everyone today. All right, in the chat section, uh, we have placed a link to sign up and take advantage of a free HIPAA consultation uh, to provide personalized insight into what your business may need to uh, properly incorporate HIPAA requirements, as well as discuss with you, uh, you know, how to ensure that you are on the right track. Now, again, the link has been provided in the chat, so simply fill out the form uh, and we'll be sure to follow up with you to provide uh, additional information and answer any questions that you may have. Now, keep in mind that you must sign up by January the 31st to take advantage of this exclusive offer. Now, if you have any general questions about services or want to learn more about COVID-19, HIPAA compliance, or the offer that we've placed in front of you today, please feel free to contact myself or John. Our information is listed on the screen. Uh, in the meantime, we'll send you a survey. And of course, we would love to hear what your thoughts are about the information you received today as well as how we can better prepare you on that special cyber journey. Lastly, uh, be sure to join us for our next coffee and conversation as we discuss Maryland Defense Cybersecurity Assistance Program, uh, which provides funding and assistance for defense contractors to comply with uh, DFARS and NIST 800-171 standards uh, for cybersecurity. Now, the Maryland Manufacturing Extension Partnership will be joining us to explain these benefits and how you may be able to take advantage of funding and resources to comply with uh, cybersecurity standards. Now, we'll be sending out more information regarding this event, so be sure to keep your eyes open for that. 
Also, feel free to follow us on social media if you're interested in getting updated industry information or join our News Blast list. Uh, you can also check us out at etrepid.com or search for at etrepid on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, or YouTube. Now, thank you for joining. Have a great week, and we hope to see you again next time.